Speaker, I beg to move the amendment standing in the name of the Leader of the Opposition and other right honourable and honourable friends. Mr Speaker, there are two questions at the heart of this bill and why we will be, we'll be opposing it tonight. First, Mr. Madam Deputy Speaker, first, how do we get an internal market after January the 1st within the UK while upholding the devolution settlements, which have been part, a vital part of our constitution now for two decades and are essential for our union? And secondly, is our country going to abide by the rule of law, a rules-based international order for which we are famous around the world and have always stood up? Madam Deputy Speaker, these are not small questions, but go to the heart of who we are as a country and to the character of this government. Let me start with the first question. An internal market is vital for trade and jobs at home, but also for our ability to strike trade deals. And it is the responsibility of the UK Government at Westminster to safeguard that market and legislate. On this, we agree with the Government. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, it must be carried out understanding that the governance of our country has changed in the last two decades. Two decades of devolution settlements were a decision that we would share power across our four nations, including devolving key powers over issues like animal welfare, food safety and aspects of environmental legislation. So we should be legislating for an internal market, but in a way that respects the role of devolved governments in having a voice in setting those standards. That is respecting the devolution settlement. And what we've heard from across the UK is that the government is not doing that, that they want to legislate with a blunderbuss approach that does not do that, and simply says the lowest standard in one parliament must become the standard for all, with no proper voice for devolved governments. So if the Westminster government, I'll give way in a moment, if the Westminster government decided to lower standards, there will be no voice for the devolved nations, even in having a discussion about those standards, because they decided not to legislate for common frameworks. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. I'm very grateful to uh, the Right Honourable Member, and I have to say I think he's getting to the, the nub of this, because, Madam Deputy Speaker, what we have is joint ministerial committees, and huge progress had been made over the course of the last few months in agreeing frameworks that would allow us to do exactly what the Right Honourable Member has asked for. Is that not the right way to proceed through frameworks in agreement with the devolved administrations, not this race to the bottom that we're going to get with the here, government still? Say that he and I come from different positions in the following respect. I want to respect the devolution settlements to uphold the union. He has a different point of view. But on this, but, but on this point, we should be legislating for common frameworks. That would be the way to respect devolution. And, and I'm sorry, and, and I don't know whether the Prime Minister even understands this legislation, but I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm sorry that on this issue, and he's got many things on his plate, but on this issue, on this issue, the government has been cavalier in its approach. They have, they, because actually since 2017, there has been the development of common frameworks, and they could have legislated for that. And that is what we will be seeking to do in the passage of this bill. Madam Deputy Speaker, these issues were prefigured in the White Paper. But since then, we have an even bigger question to confront. Now, let me say right at the outset, we want the smoothest trade across our United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. There is a way to resolve these issues in the Joint Committee set up for this purpose. I have to say, Madam Deputy Speaker, from a man who said he wanted to get Brexit done and won an election on it, this bill gets Brexit undone by, 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 by overturning key aspects of the protocol that were uh, agreed. And, and, I, do, and I, do say, I do say to the I do say to the Prime Minister, while I have been part of many issues of contention across this dispatch, bo dispatch box, I never thought respecting international law would, in my lifetime, be a matter of disagreement. I stood, a, I stood opposite the Prime Minister's predecessor, David Cameron, as Leader of the Opposition for five years. I, I don't know why he's rolling his eyes, Mr. De Madam Deputy Speaker. I disagreed with him profoundly, I disagreed with him profoundly on many issues. But I could never have imagined him coming along and saying we are going to legislate to break international law on an agreement we had signed less than a year earlier as a country. But that is what this bill does, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, in the government's own words. And I want to address three questions at the heart of this issue. Is it right to threaten to break the law in the way the government proposes? Is it necessary to do so? And will it help 
our country? The answer to each of those questions is no. Let's remember the context of this and the principle here. If there is one thing we are known for around the world, it is the rule of law. The country of the Magna Carta, the country that is known for having the mother, being the mother of all parliaments, the country that out of the darkness of the Second World War helped found the United Nations. Our global reputation for rule-making, not rule-breaking, is one of the reasons we are so respected around the world. And when you ask people to think of Britain, they think of the rule of law. And let's be clear after the Prime Minister's speech, despite what he said, this is not an argument about remain versus leave. It is an argument about right versus wrong. The Brexiteer and former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Lord Lamont, says the bill is impossible to defend. The Brexiteer and former Attorney General, who helped negotiate and signed off this deal as Attorney General, says the bill is unconscionable. And the Brexiteer, Lord Howard, his former boss, said this, I never thought it was a thing I'd hear a British minister, far less a Conservative minister say, which was that the government was going to act, invite Parliament to act in breach of international law. We have a reputation for probity, for upholding the rule of law, and it's a reputation that is very precious and ought to be safeguarded. And I'm afraid it was severely damaged by the bill. Mr. I will give way. Does he think the EU has been negotiating in good faith? <laughs> well, it's very interesting that the um, uh, honor, right honourable gentleman should say that because there's a report that came out from the Northern Ireland Select Committee, chaired by Conservative, uh, today, uh, and this is what it said. I, this is my answer to him. These talks began in March and continued throughout the summer in a spirit of good faith and mutual respect for the delicate arrangements in Northern Ireland. So that's what the Conservative controlled Select Committee says uh, about, this, uh, about, this, about this issue. Now, Mr. Speaker, now, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister has said, the Prime Minister has said many times, the Prime Minister has said many times he wants to bring unity to the country during his premiership. I therefore congratulate him on having in just one short year united his five predecessors. Unfortunately, unfortunately, their point of agreement is that he is trashing the reputation of this country and trashing the reputation of his office. And, and, and why, why are these five former Prime Ministers so united on this point? Because, Ms. Madam Deputy Speaker, they know our moral authority in the world comes from our commitment to the rule of law and keeping our word. We rightly condemn China when it rides roughshod over the treaties dictating the future of Hong Kong. We say they sign them in good faith. We say they are going back on their word. We say, Madam Deputy Speaker, they can't be trusted. And his defence? Don't worry, I can't be trusted either. And what will they say to us from now on? What will they throw back at us? That we too don't keep to international law. I give way to the Honourable Lady. I thank the Honourable Member. Does, did the party opposite keep their word to the British voters? Well, actually, yes, we do, and I'll, tell you, and I'll tell her why. Because we respect the fact that the Conservative Party, under this Prime Minister, won the election. He got his mandate to deliver his Brexit deal. The thing he said was, and I'm sure she recalls it, it was probably on her leaflets, oven ready. It's not me that's coming along and saying it's half-baked, it's him. He's coming along and saying the deal I signed, the deal I agreed, actually, and I'll get to this in my speech, actually, it is, what's the word? Ambiguous, problematic. I wonder whether he actually read the deal in the first place. Um, uh, I, oh, what a pleasure. Yes, I'll give way to my honourable friend. I thank my right honourable friend for giving way, and he's making an extremely good speech. But uh, could he perhaps tell the House who on earth might have signed this terrible deal with so many ambiguities uh, less than nine months ago? <laughs> I do believe my honourable friend makes an important point. It's the Prime Minister um, who's, who, who signed uh, this deal. Now, I want, Madam Deputy Speaker, in fairness to the Prime Minister, I want to deal with each of the government's arguments that they've made in the last few days uh, for this action. And it's quite hard to keep count um, of these different arguments. Uh, you know you're losing the argument when you keep making lots of different arguments. But I want to give the House, Madam Deputy Speaker, the top five. Right. First, 
Uh, let's deal with the argument about blockades. Now, that argument, Madam Deputy Speaker, made its first outing in the Telegraph on Saturday from the Prime Minister, and obviously it made uh, a big appearance today. I have to say, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I don't like the ramping up of the rhetoric from the European Union that, that was on Thursday, that was on Thursday, following the Prime Minister's publication of this bill. But even by the standards of this Prime Minister, this is as ridiculous an argument as I've ever heard, even by his standards. And, I, and, and let, me, let me explain to him why. And, and the point was very well made by the former Attorney General this morning. This is what Article 16, this is what Article 16 of the Protocol says. If the application of the Protocol leads to serious economic, societal or environmental difficulties that are liable to persist or to diversion of trade, the Union or the United Kingdom may unilaterally take appropriate safeguard measures. In other words, let us just say that this threat somehow materialised. And by the way, I believe it's DEFRA officials who'd have to implement uh, this threat, making it even more absurd that it would happen. Let's just say this threat materialised. It's not overturning the protocol that is the right thing to do, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's upholding the protocol because of Article 16. And don't take my word for it, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker. Take the word of the former Attorney General, who definitely read the protocol, uh, and who wrote this morning, uh, and I, I quote, there are clear and lawful responses available to Her Majesty's Government. And then, and the Prime Minister tried to slip this in, I, I don't know whether the House noticed, there is an irony here, which is that, as if this wasn't enough, this bill does precisely nothing to address the issue of the transport of food from Great Britain to Northern Ireland. It is about two issues where they're going to override international law. It's about exit declarations, Northern Ireland to GB, and the definition of state aid relating to Northern Ireland. Now, if the Prime Minister wants to tell us that there's another part of this bill that I haven't noticed that will deal with this supposed threat of the blockade, he can, I'll give way to him. I'll very happily give way to him and tell me, to, he can tell us, I'm sure he's read it, I'm sure he knows it, I'm sure he knows it in detail because he's a details man. Uh, uh, come on, come on, tell us what, 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 clause de, what clause protects the threat that he says he's worried about, about uh, GB to Northern Ireland exports. I give way to him. All of the right honourable gentlemen can't give way unless he's asked to. There you have it. He didn't read the protocol. He hasn't read the bill. He doesn't know his stuff. Right. Let's deal with the, let's deal with the second bogus argument. Second, he claimed on Wednesday it was necessary to protect the Good Friday Agreement. That's the first uh, outing uh, for this was on Wednesday at Prime Minister's Questions. I have to say to him, I'd rather trust the authors of the Good Friday Agreement uh, than the Prime Minister, who has prominent members of the government who opposed the agreement at the time. But this is what John Major and Tony Blair uh, wrote. The bill... Oh, they don't like John Major, I know. The, the bill puts the Good Friday, uh, the, the bill puts the Good Friday Agreement at risk because it, this is very serious because it negates the predictability, the political stability, and legal clarity that are integral to the delicate balance between the North and South of Ireland that is at the core of the peace process. These are very important words from two former Prime Ministers who helped both of whom helped win us peace in Northern Ireland. And he may not want to believe them, but he will, I hope, believe himself. Because this is what he said. This is what he said. Maybe not. Because this is what he said about the Northern Ireland Protocol. And I quote, There are particular circumstances in Northern Ireland at the border that deserve particular respect and sensitivity. And that is what they have received in the deal. It's a great deal for Northern Ireland. I don't understand this, Madam Deputy Speaker. He signed the deal. It's his deal. It's the deal that he said would protect the people of Northern Ireland. And I have to say to him, this is not just legislative hooliganism on any issue. It is on the most sensitive issues of all. And I think we should take the word of two former prime ministers of this country who helped secure peace in Northern, in, in Northern Ireland. I will give them. For giving way. Before he lectures the Prime Minister about reading documentation and he starts lecturing us about the Good Friday Agreement, does he 
recognise that, first of all, the Good Friday Agreement talks about the principle of consent, about changing the constitutional position of Northern Ireland, which this protocol does. And the Good Friday Agreement has within it a mechanism to safeguard uh, the, uh, the minorities in, in Northern Ireland through a cross-community vote, which again the protocol removed. So before he starts talking about the threats to the Good Friday Agreement, does he not recognise that the protocol was a threat to the Good Friday Agreement in the first place? The honourable gentleman didn't like the protocol at all. He'd rather have not had the protocol. He and I just have a disagreement on this issue. I, I believe that it was necessary to make special arrangements for Northern Ireland or for the UK to be in the EU Customs Union to avoid a hard border in Ireland. Now, now, now that's why the Prime Minister came along and said the protocol was the right thing to do. Let me deal with the third uh, excuse that we've heard, Madam Deputy Speaker. This is the, it was all a bit of a rush excuse. <laughs> or as the Prime Minister said in his article, times were, quote, torrid and there were serious misunderstandings. Uh, m m Madam Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister tries to pretend this is some new issue, but they've been warned for months about the way the protocol would work. The Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, who's sitting in his place, was warned at the Select Committee in March and was asked about these issues. The Business Secretary was written to by the House of Lords Committee in April. And let's just get this straight for a minute, because I think it's important to take a step back. What the Prime Minister is coming to this House to tell us today is that his flagship achievement the deal he told us was a triumph. The deal he said, as I said, that was oven ready. The deal on which he fought and won the general election is now contradictory and ambiguous. Madam Deputy Speaker, what incompetence. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. failure of government, yeah. governance. Yeah. Exactly and right. and Madam, De Madam Deputy Speaker, how dare he try and blame everyone else? Can I say to the Prime Minister, this time he can't blame the right honourable member for Maidenhead. He can't blame John Major. He can't blame the judges. He can't blame the civil servants. He can't sack the cabinet secretary again. There's only one person responsible for it, and that's him. This is his deal. It's his mess. It's his failure. For the first time in his life, it's time to take responsibility. It's time to fess up. Either he wasn't straight with the country about the deal in the first place, or he didn't understand it. Because, Madam Deputy Speaker, a competent government would never have entered into a binding agreement with provisions it could not live with. And if such a government somehow missed the point but woke up later, it would have done what any competent business would do after it realises it can't live with the terms of a contract. It would negotiate a way out in good faith. And that's why, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is also unnecessary. Because there is a mechanism designed for exactly this purpose in the protocol, in the agreement, the Joint Committee on the Northern Ireland Protocol. And what did the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster say on the 11th of March at the Brexit Select Committee? He was asked about the state aids issue, he'll recall that. And he said, and I quote, the effective working of the protocol is a matter for the Joint Committee to resolve. The, the, the remaining issues to which this bill speaks aren't insignificant, but nor are they insurmountable. And that is the right way to pursue them, not an attempt at illegality. Now, let me come back to the excuses. Fourth, uh, on Sunday, there was the, sec the Justice Secretary's the fire alarm defence. So this, we don't want to have to do this, um, but we might have to. I want to be clear with the House about something very, very important about a decision to pass this bill, and I have great respect for the old member for Bromley uh, and Chislehurst, but I, I want to make this point. The very act of passing this bill is itself a breach of international yeah. law. And I think it's very, I, do, I think it'd be wrong for honourable and right honourable members on either side of the House to be under any illusions about this as they decide which lobby to go into tonight. If we pass this bill, uh, even if there's a nod and a wink from the Prime Minister to the Honourable Member for uh, Bromley and Chislehurst, we equip the government with the power to break yeah. the law. Yeah. That in itself is a breach of the Northern Ireland Protocol and therefore a breach of international law. Yeah. Right. I listen carefully to the, his formulation and understand much of what he says. However, 
an, a, an act passed by this House only becomes law when it comes into force. You yeah. will be right, I'd submit, to say that as soon as that any, of, <coughs> any of these provisions came into force, we will potentially breach international law. That is not quite the same thing as I think you would fairly concede. Uh, that, that's not a risk we are going to take, uh, Madam uh, Deputy uh, uh, Speaker. Um, so, so the fire alarm defence simply doesn't work. And finally, I want to deal with the last defence, Madam Deputy Speaker. This was floated as a trial balloon, you might say, by the Northern Ireland Secretary, I believe it was last Tuesday. He said it was a breach of the law in a quote-unquote specific and limited way. Madam Deputy Speaker, this really is a new way of thinking about legal questions. It now turns out that breaking the law specifically and in a limited way is a reasonable defence for this government. We've all heard of self-defence, the alibi defence, the innocence defence. Now we have the Johnson defence. You can break the law, but in a specific and limited way. And, and Madam Deputy Speaker, think about the current grave context we face. The Home Secretary, out today in the newspapers, warning everyone, you must abide by the law. Yeah. By the way, on this, the Home Secretary is absolutely right. And she says this, I know that as part of our national effort, the law-abiding majority will stick to these new rules, but there will be a small minority who do not. You couldn't make it up, Madam Deputy Speaker. What she didn't say in this article, but what we now know about this government, is that the Johnson defence means something very specific. There is one rule for the British public and another rule for this government. Pioneered by Cummings, implemented by Johnson. That is the Johnson rule. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is the wrong thing to do. It is not necessary and it is also deeply damaging for the country. Let's just think about this in terms of the impact on our country in the negotiations. The government's hope is that this will make a deal more likely. But that relies on the notion that reneging on a deal we made less than a year ago with the party we are, negoti we are negotiating with will make them more likely to trust us, not less. If I think about our everyday lives, and if we think about an agreement we made a year ago with somebody, and we were seeking to have another negotiation with them, and we came along and unilaterally reneged on the first deal we made, would it make them more likely to trust us or less likely to trust us? Obviously, it would make them less likely to trust us. And we know the risks. We, I, I very much hope the Prime Minister gets a deal. We absolutely need a deal as a country. We know the risks of a no-deal strategy, of no deal if this strategy goes wrong. The Prime Minister said last week that no deal is somehow, quote-unquote, a good outcome. He's wrong. I hear from businesses all the time, and I'm sure the business secretary who's sitting in his place does too, who are deeply worried about the danger of no deal. I know what he thinks about their views because of his famous four-letter rant, but this is what they have to say. Nissan says there could be no guarantee about its Sunderland plant if there were tariffs on UK to EU trade. Ford have said no deal will be disastrous. The NFU say it will be catastrophic for British farming. Indeed, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, when he was in the job as DEFRA secretary, said the same thing. We're in the biggest economic crisis for 300 years, the biggest public health crisis for 100 years. No deal is not some game. It's about the livelihoods of millions of people across our country. And what about the prize trade deal with the United States? I know the Prime Minister thinks he has a friend in President Trump, but even he must recognise he must be able to deal with both sides. This is what the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, said. The UK must respect the Northern Ireland Protocol as signed with the EU. If the UK violates that international treaty, and Brexit undermines the Good Friday Accord, there'll be absolutely no chance of a US-UK trade agreement passing the Congress. This is the signal we're sending to our friends and allies around the world, the country known for the rule of law, the country that abides by the law, the country that founded international law. This is the signal we are sending. Madam Deputy Speaker, that's why we cannot support this bill and we will oppose it tonight. The government must go back, remove the sections breaking international law, ensure the bill works in a way that respects the devolution settlements. That's what a responsible, competent, and law-abiding government would do. This is a pivotal moment in determining the future 
of our country, who we are and how we operate. In shaping that future, we have to stand up for the traditions that matter, our commitment to the rule of law. This bill speaks of a government, a prime minister that is casual, not to say cavalier and reckless about the gravity of the issues he confronts. He should be focusing on securing a Brexit deal, not breaking international law and risking no deal. He is cavalier on international law. He is cavalier on our traditions. This is not the serious leadership we need. That's why we will oppose this bill tonight. The original question was, that the bill be now read a second time since when an amendment has been proposed as on the order paper. The question is that the amendment be made. And before I call the chairman of the select committee, I should draw to the attention of the House that 101 members are hoping to catch my eye from the back benches. Um, it won't be possible to call everyone, but in order to try to allow as many people as possible to participate in such an important debate, we will have a time limit with immediate effect of four minutes. Sir William Cash. Madam Speaker, uh, what would be unconscionable would for us to have left the EU lawfully, which the EU has accepted, and then allow them to threaten us and to strangle our jobs and businesses by imposing unfair state aid rules, which go much wider than traditional subsidies, 